Here's what I would direct this to, but I have to say I'm really, and maybe it's a, a function of my age, but I have equated iPads and phones in my brain for the longest time, and I don't treat them as different. Maybe I've never used either one of them in the classroom now. I've only ever used them at home. What struck me was how you really are presenting them as very different kinds of devices, and I'm not sure if I'm yeah, I mean, this is kind of more of an observation, but kind of the trend I saw across what you were talking about was really the focus that was taking what is a very simple tool and sort of really developing the deeper pedagogical uses out of it. And I think you know, you're right, I, you know, we survey our incoming, you guys have seen this slide, but we survey our incoming freshmen and ask them what they do on the web, and the amount, it's like, for all the creative things they could do on the web, it's less than 25%, so the thing that comes in at 90% is social media, and it just, yeah, totally brings that point home, but, so I really love the fact that, the other distraction I often see is people that want to use the really big, complicated technology, and that keeps you from doing the really big, complicated pedagogy. <laughs> <laughs> um, with regards to the use of iPad, our medical students are all given iPads. Um, and they, 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 they fulfill certain tasks under time pressure. But when they have finished with their, their tasks, um, the big question that you ask is whether we allow them to go online. And because it has to be con uh, continuously streaming, we have no way of blocking the Wi-Fi. But actually, when we survey the students, they like the idea of being able to go online shopping, play games, <laughs> in between the tasks. Because these are very intensive, draining tasks that we ask of them, you know, clinical cases. And in between, as long as they don't go searching online for the answers to the questions, <laughs> which they don't, or at least I have to constantly monitor them, but actually they really benefit from being able to relax in between mm -hmm. uh, because of the stress that we put them in. Right. So you really sh see, see them going shopping, playing games, playing games with each other across the tables. And as a policy, uh, I mean, I, I hope you can consider uh, that because it, I think it's it's not necessary to actually restrict the students because they know how to manage their time. These are young adults, right. so, you know, but, uh, but of course you have restrictions, like you have to fulfill certain tasks within certain periods of time. Right. Yeah, we, we observed in a, a large lecture class where students were using an online um, uh, sort of system, feedback system, yeah. and so we sat in the back and so we could see all of their screens. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's true that, you know, we sort of kept seeing the flip to like, you know, there's a fluffy bunny over here, there's some tricks, and there's some shoes over here, and there's, you know, and we surveyed them afterward, and we asked them, you know, one, was that a distraction for them, how did they feel about it, and another one was, was it a distraction for them to see other people's screens. I mean, they all self-reported, you know, of course, like they were, and, mm -hmm. and Actually, the professor's feeling is those are the same people that would be daydreaming at that point. Mm -hmm. They're done with their problem set, right? So they would be daydreaming or writing a note or going off somewhere else <laughs> anyway, but now they're doing it in digital space. I mean, I'm, I don't think personally I'm totally convinced about that yet, and I think we have to think a more thoughtfully, but I think it's a really interesting point to bring up and, and talk about what they're accustomed to doing, what we're accustomed to doing, and kind of where we're going to meet them a little bit in the middle. But it's also very much about faculty preference for us and what faculty are comfortable with. But I, I do think um, engaging students in conversations about that, being transparent about how it's making you feel as a professor. You know, when I see you doodling throughout class, I'm wondering if I've lost you. I'm wondering if there's more I can do to keep you connected. And to have the students say, Dr. Tao, I doodle because that's when I'm focused. Doodling keeps me in the present moment. and so. I mean, if we're going to take iPads away or disconnect them at certain moments, we should also take the pens and the paper and the notebooks away. <laughs>
But I would add, I mean, the, the research in cognitive science there is sort of complicated with that. And doodling actually is a way to be more present and mindful. I just don't know if online shopping, and I sometimes, I don't think I'm online, I'm, I'm browsing. <laughs> I just don't know if that's exactly the same thing. I mean, your experience is one where I've been in the back of a room evaluating one of our faculty members for who's coming up for promotion or tenure, and I actually am incredibly distracted. Right. Like, oh, the Facebook and that. Too. So actually, I think there's an awful lot of room for research right. yeah. on that. Yeah. We have seen it be successful, though. We visited a course this semester, an American Studies course, where the students were using a WordPress site to socially comment on a text mm -hmm. together. And when we visited mm -hmm. the course, I'm not sure if Lauren has had that conversation with the students already uh, uh, about mm -hmm. engagement in the classroom, but they were all consistently on the site, not off on Facebook right. or shopping, which yeah. we were really surprised by. Because yeah. <laughs> it's a big lecture. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But they were doing something. Right. They were doing right. something. They were doing something. Constantly engaged in the yeah. tool. Right. Yeah. All the way in the back. Yeah, so um, this is kind of related to the online shopping versus really <laughs> not. <laughs> and I guess what I'm wondering is, I mean, this, these are some fabulous examples of how to use uh, these different tools and technologies. Um, but I guess what I'm kind of grappling with still is when do we get a break from our devices? And it seems increasingly um, the classroom is not that space, right? And so I'm just sort of grappling with that in my own teaching and thinking about uh, some of these trends is, you know, there is this question of like screen fatigue or digital fatigue, mm -hmm. how the brain processes information online versus offline. I know for myself, whenever I have a project to do, the first the, the first thing I do is shut down all my devices, mm -hmm. right? Like I cannot function in the same way critically online as I can offline. And so um, just throw that out there for extended conversation. When do we get some break from this. <laughs> <laughs> this is not in the classroom, right? That's sort of becoming. I mean, I don't think that thoughts. we don't. I I totally agree. We don't. You know, we don't try. Our goal is never to bring technology into the classroom. You know, it's not like we're not trying to get everybody to bring have their technology in the classroom. That's, and I think that um, you know, a lot of the stuff that's going on at Smith is blended learning, and a lot of it is tech outside of the classroom. I would say that right now, the majority of it is tech outside of the classroom, and in classroom spaces are still kind of reserved for those face-to-face -face discussion and problem solving and exploration. You know, I don't know where that's headed. Um, but, I, but I would say that, you know, as we kind of design the implementation of any technology, iPad or whatever, you know, we're also mindful of the number of kind of technology-related tasks. And so it does have to be essential to what you're doing um, for it to be something that kind of passes our litmus test of should it be there. And we also very often advise faculty to also scale it back, mm -hmm. you know, to produce mm -hmm. a digital narrative on top of, uh, you know, another film or, you know, on top of searching a web or answering problem sets, you know, there has to be a balance and what you expect the students. And, and I think that that is continuous for us. I think that we'll always grapple with that. Yeah, I mean, I would assume that that is, um, I mean, although after listening to your presentation, I'm really uneasy about any assumptions about anything related <laughs> to tech or tech models. It's beautifully, um, you know, called out all those unreflected upon frameworks. Um, but I, I would hold that part of what it means to build the digital liberal arts is to, um, assume intentionality around when is it appropriate, when is it not appropriate, when is it, when is it meaningful, when is it distracting to have technology um, embedded in, in a learning experience. Each of the online faculty who, who are teaching at Muhlenberg have really significant non-tech experiences in their classes. In the astronomy class, st students meet for field trips on top of a mountain to watch stars. Um, in the American government class, students are required to read actual physical newspapers. Um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the other physics class, they're building, it's a, it has a DIY lab component, and they're building circuits on their kitchen table. Later, they're going to videotape their circuits working and share them online, but each of those classes, even in the completely online classes, is design, by design hybrid in, in other kinds of ways.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.